ready to start. So for everyone that's here, uh, welcome. Uh, because we are such a small group, please feel free to uh, turn on your camera so I can see your response and see if my message hits home. Um, and um, also, uh, let's see how this works. But um, I trust uh, you as adult people to uh, actively interrupt me in a respectful way if you want to ask a question. So if you, um, for example, if I'm talking about something and you want to ask a question, but I'm in the middle of a story, uh, you can use, of course, to raise your hand or type it in the chat and uh, Kien will help me uh, with facilitation. But um, sometimes I will pause and please feel free to just unmute and then ask the question if you have one that's relevant at that point in time. And I will uh, respectfully park it or answer it at the spot, right? So that's my responsibility. So that's a few ground rules uh, just to start. Um, if everything is all right, you can see my screen and I will put my um, thing into presenter mode. Yes, that's even better. So I um, decided to use Mural for this presentation um, because uh, for me, it was uh, easier to visually align uh, along the talk, along the stories I want to talk about instead of uh, the old PowerPoint. Um, but it was the first time uh, that I really made a presentation this way. I'm used to doing trainings. I, uh, I am a PST. I work with Scrum facilitators with uh, Chi Hong, uh, Kai and um, and Zirian, who are also in this conference uh, uh, presenting. Um, but this is the first time that I actually do a presentation this way. So uh, please bear with me if anything goes uh, a little bit bumpy. Um, and please also give me feedback if you have tips uh, about this in the end, uh, because I'm sure there's some more experienced mural <laughs> users here than me. Um, Right now I work uh, as a trainer with Scrum facilitators, uh, but I'm also uh, fully um, working with the Dutch police. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm not um, a gun for hire, as you say, which has a double meaning with, when you mention police, but uh, I am uh, really an internal agile coach there. So um, I do some training and uh, uh, workshops and presentations on the side with Scrum facilitators, but my employer is the Dutch police which has benefits and drawbacks, but I will get back to that later. Um, so when a Scrum Day Vietnam came up, I uh, decided that uh, this was a great opportunity to share a bit about this, um, maybe for many people, unusual place to uh, practice Scrum, at least unusual um, part of the organization, right? Because uh, every big organization, like the Dutch police, we have uh, 10,000 plus employees in the Netherlands, um, and the Netherlands has a population of around 17 million people, which includes kids and elderly. So you can imagine uh, how large this organization is um, in contrast to the working population in the Netherlands, of which I don't have any figures uh, at this moment, but this is significantly less than the uh, 17 million people I just mentioned, right? So 10,000 people uh, plus is a, a really large organization. And they have a really large IT department. So there's uh, been some Agile and Scrum in there for a while now. Um, uh, I think more than five years, but there's uh, the, the IT department is just a very small part. And that's not where I'm located at, at this point. I'm located at um, uh, an investigative unit that's uh, investigating cybercrime. And uh, there, uh, working with Scrum and Agile. Uh, uh, so we'll get to that in this topic. And that's why I thought it was interesting to tell you a bit about my experience there. Uh, but also a bit more in general about what happens in the larger organization. Because as you can imagine, I am not the only Scrum Master coach uh, working with uh, Scrum and Agile in this organization of 10,000 people. So I will have some stories also uh, from other parts. Um, yeah, I think uh, I, I will just dive into it because um, I have a lot to tell. And um, most of the time I fill my time more than enough uh, with which uh, some of the participants of the training that I just uh, finished up yesterday and uh, the day before uh, can attest to. Um, you should ask Hong about that. He, uh, he, will, tell, he will tell you. Um, 
and a special shout out to Kai who provided the training with me. So he has to say the same <laughs> thing about filling time with stories, I think. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's showing the laughing emoticon. So um, let's uh, uh, go into it. Um, and first I want to like uh, pull back uh, the curtain a bit by giving you the total view of my uh, mural. So this is what we will be uh, looking at in the next uh, few minutes and uh, which will be, we will be exploring. Um, so I have uh, like four topics that I want to really get into and a fifth bonus topic if we have time left. Um, that's because I didn't really prepare the topic but I thought it would be nice you know, if there's no specific questions and we have time left. Anyway, I bet you people are itching to know what the five topics are uh, beyond the, the titles that you might be able to read if you squint really hard at your screen right now. Um, before we go do that, I want to do a little bit of interaction. So um, you may unmute if you feel like you want to help me at this part. And uh, I want to again uh, ask you if you can Please turn on your camera so I can see you because it's much nicer that way for me to talk to instead of just talking to myself, Lawrence, Kien, and Chi Hong. <laughs> With, of course, eating. <laughs> so you may unmute yourself also right now. Hi, nice to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to uh, quickly ask you um, in your um, experience, in your uh, daily life, um, uh, uh, what is uh, the first thing that comes to mind when you think of police? And you may just speak it out or type it in the chat. They give me penalty ticket for illegal parking or speeding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nice one. Okay. The same. Yes. And how do you feel about that? I'm feeling okay. I'm breaking the law, so I have to pay the price. <laughs> and it's a bit of a tricky topic in Hong Kong because like because of the political environment. A lot of the people in Hong Kong feel very scared of the police. But in general, <laughs> for the political issue, we feel a bit safer when the police is uh, walking around, patrolling the area. I, we have no idea what they do. We just see them patrolling around the street, checking, writing something on the board. That, that's all we love. Okay. Okay, so not really transparent what they're up to, what their goals are, what their focus is, right? Yeah. So that doesn't sound very agile, uh, but they are very agile in terms of speed, right? If they want to catch someone, they uh, put on a siren and they go, wee, 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 and they move. But yeah. very fast. <laughs> but, but what the goals are, well, we don't know. Uh, I hope to reveal a bit of that in this talk about the Dutch police, at least, and how uh, I think Scrum and Agile can help there. I also see in the chat uh, that in uh, Vietnam um, is generally not a good impression with the police. I take it that um, the police is not really seen as a friend. Can, is that a good interpretation? <coughs> I think so. Yeah, I, may, maybe that goes for, for more of Asia, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, that's, um, you also see that in the news, of course. Uh, I mean, uh, we get a lot of news from America in, uh, in, in Holland here. You see a lot of news about the police, of course, not being your friend, especially in these times in America with the elections coming and uh, the Trump regime. But it's in more countries like that. Well, in the Netherlands, it's a bit different. Um, uh, and uh, we'll uh, see what that means uh, uh, later uh, because there's a, uh, as I said before, another <laughs> topic, uh, drawbacks and uh, positive points. Um, so let's dive into the topics and see um, if maybe we can give some, uh, some ideas how uh, police work could be improved with Scrum. And not just being a friend or <laughs> not giving you speeding tickets, Lawrence, because uh, <laughs> that is your own responsibility. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can't think of, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's go to the key insights. So when you walk out of this uh, topic, um, this is what I um, would like to have uh, um, uh, discussed. And I hope this is what sticks, right? So these are our four points that uh, should stick, plus one a bonus point if we get time. So um, the first one is actually, um, I could summarize, Scrum fits police work. We'll look at why. It's a short theoretical exercise, but Scrum 
and empiricism can be translated or fitted to other work than IT uh, product development. Uh, while that is where the, its history lies, we will see that uh, it can be fitted to police work. It, it should be fit, uh, a fit if we uh, inspect it. So then I want to take you into um, an example of uh, how Scrum helped um, uh, the police force um, by focusing on the true pains of the people involved. So this created great buy-in, but also in large part the success. And I think this is for every change, right? Every change you want to get in an organization or with a group of people, you have to make sure to address the pains involved, uh, 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 pains of the people involved, otherwise it won't work. So remember that also in your own job, right? Third one, and this is more of a personal uh, uh, lesson learned, I could say. Um, so don't force Scrum onto an existing work process uh, unless you want to lose respect or buy-in. Um, and this is really about forcing, right? So um, Scrum fits in the police, but I have a story about where it maybe um, doesn't fit for everyone. And that's important. So you don't have to force your, your, your views there. Um, Gunther also told, talked about this, right? Being pool, you have to pull stuff. And I also hear, heard Hong uh, talk about it in his session. And the last one, uh, also uh, an insight that's uh, from the police, but also wider. Um, that's very important for me. Um, there's this uh, uh, talk and book by Dan Pink called Drive. And it uh, talks about how autonomy, mastery and purpose are important things um, to um, motivate people to, for intrinsic motivation. That's what drive means. And um, I want to just explore a bit how that connects to Agile and Scrum and how it can help because that helps me uh, with the previous uh, topic, the, the number three, the struggle I have. Um, and if we have time, just very quickly, um, if you have multiple teams, even if they work very independently, there's always some stuff that you might want them to do together. Uh, and there are also some overarching rhythm uh, uh, and empirical process uh, transparency, inspect and adapt at regular intervals can really be beneficial. Um, so that's really important. And I have some examples for that to, uh, to make you see how we approach that, if we have time, right? So um, we go into the Scrum fits police work, uh, but does police work fit Scrum? And uh, we came from, uh, from this one, right? So Scrum and empiricism uh, can be translated or fitted to other work than IT. Um, this is also something that you see coming into the Scrum guide more and more. The, the last 2017 update also uh, had, had a real uh, uh, full paragraph explaining that it's not just for IT, right? with all kinds of examples that I mentioned there. Um, so um, just really quickly, and you can react in any type you like, who here um, is not from IT, does not work in IT? You can use the reactions, you can use the uh, hands up feature, whatever you like. So there's two things could be going on here. Either everyone works in IT <laughs> or uh, you're all falling asleep right now. And in a latter case, I'm a bit in trouble, but um, I will continue nonetheless. Ah, we have a, a response. Thank you for uh, interacting uh, very much. And uh, uh, Hong, I know my audio is working because you're typing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also have uh, a lot of clients that are long, from long IT background. They are doing some social work. I will, oh, yeah. I will do a training to them like two weeks later. So they talk a lot about their challenge. They thought it just for maybe long pop organization, but turned out to be really similar to banks and insurance as well. I imagine that would be the same portfolio. Yeah, cool, cool. Okay. Well, uh, we have at least some people that also uh, have experience from non-IT. Um, but if you look at the definition of Scrum, to move along here, um, it is uh, it can be, uh, I understand that it can be read as a pretty IT-focused uh, sentence because we're talking about uh, solving complex adaptive problems, um, uh, but also uh, uh, delivering products, right? And products, in our uh, view, uh, is often 
either um, something that you can actually touch or it's software. That's what our minds do, do with the word products, I think. So it can be hard to translate this to a service or um, a, a, a less concrete product that you develop, which has very clear users and uh, uh, producers and uh, a very clear stakeholder group. So um, when I came into the police force and especially working with this um, investigation team, I uh, immediately uh, dove into this problem and uh, looked at the translation. And it translates pretty well, actually, I guess, uh, because if you look at it, um, my team, the teams I work with, they investigate or prevent or disrupt. Um, so this is like addressing the terms of Scrum, I think. Uh, past, current, and future crimes, um, which are pretty complex and adaptive problems, crimes. Um, and they deliver proof in case files and they deliver suspects. So these are something like products, I think. And um, they try, at least they tell me all the time, even before they knew what Scrum was about, that they want to make an impact on society, a positive impact by doing this, um, the highest possible impact even on society. So this translates to the highest possible value, I think. And the value, that's, that's the interesting thing, is uh, not just arresting bad guys or kicking their ass or whatever your police does. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, really uh, justice served, but also prevention, because uh, every time we arrest someone um, and uh, bring them to court successfully, then uh, we make sure to get some media attention for it, to also have a preventive uh, a measure uh, to say, well, we're working on this and we will catch you, right? But don't do it. <laughs> and uh, interrupt really quickly. So more to your point, can you explain more how to prevent future crimes? Because I feel like it's more like morality report. You have some machine learning, AI, some prophecy tell you someone will commit a crime maybe two more. I mean, just how does that really happen? Yeah, so uh, a, a part of the prevention is marketing, right? But um, we also uh, have a big intelligence unit, which is not the investigative team itself, which is a separate unit. And it's very secretive because there's, of course, a lot of uh, uh, data there that, that should not be taken lightly uh, in lights of privacy. So it's um, a bit different than, for instance, in Russia, uh, where uh, the KGB was here about and stuff has hacker groups uh, it's been published about I, I'm, i've not been there of course but um and uh, um here in the netherlands we have pretty strict rules and regulations around privacy so we have to be really diligent who gets to see uh, uh information in terms of preventing but we do have some models in hacker for uh and uh, try to gather intel and quite recently there was a big uh, thing in the news um, about EncroChat, which is a, was an um, encrypted chat uh, that the criminal, criminals used very much for all kinds of stuff, uh, which the um, uh, national uh, team that uh, is in cybercrime, we, I'm in regional team of cybercrime, there's a national team also, uh, managed to um, break the encryption. So that was a big source for uh, proof and leads and uh, stuff, um, uh, with which we hopefully also prevented crime by, uh, uh, for instance, taking over um, a, a torturing dungeon. We discovered that and it wasn't used yet, but it was there. So that was <laughs> kind of a big thing. <laughs> so I hope this helps a bit, uh, Lawrence. Very good answer, thank you. Yeah, and also a very important thing we do, and especially in my team, I see this a lot, um, is a damage compensation to victims because um, criminals are not doing crime for nothing. They want to gain something, often money, right? So um, the money they gain, they steal it from the victims in most cases. And um, um, a very important part for us is also knowing how much damage is and how we can uh, litigate from that uh, in, the, in the courtroom to uh, get back the damages, right? Um, so that's a really big part of the value. And also, and that's maybe a curveball, we also want to reha rehabilit rehabilitate uh, suspects sometimes because I'm in cybercrime and cybercrime also a lot of the crime actually happens by um, uh, uh, young people that still have a chance to better their life. 
and maybe use their skills for um, uh, for new uh, for new ways of preventing crime by going into cybersecurity uh, positions in uh, companies or, or doing uh, white hat hacking, right? So um, these are all important aspects of value in police work in my uh, my case, and. Um, Just to round off this first topic, because uh, we, we are really, uh, I promise, uh, my promise of uh, talking for a long time is, uh, is, is working excellently. Um, I just want to talk about some, some recent cases that we had. So you have my context where I work from. And this is mainly important for the third topic again. So we're also, I'm planting a seed, so you stay active uh, listening for the third topic here. Um, so uh, we do a lot of uh, research also into uh, DDoS attacks. And a DDoS attack is quite complex, as you can see in this picture. Um, you see here uh, how it works a bit, very simplified. Um, but basically what it is, it, it means a site is unreachable or uh, a service is unreachable because a criminal uh, overloads it with traffic. Yeah, there's a lot of technical details under it, but that's the, the short version. And uh, there were a few cases where this happened and we re uh, investigated it and actually got people uh, for it. So that was uh, quite a success. Um, and um, it was extra important because of Corona right now, because um, people have to stay at home. We have again, a partial lockdown here. I heard Belgium has just gone into full lockdown again and it's all over the world. There's these lockdown events, right? So we're extra dependent on uh, digital services. And in one of these cases, uh, a hacker, and it turned out to be a kid, he uh, uh, DDoSed government uh, uh, sites that were out of the air. It wasn't the official corona information, but other information. This was extra um, important for us to fix it, of course. Yeah, I mean, because I think because somehow they, they, they need more the pushing. So. I uh, just muted uh, Dave because I think he was talking not to us. <laughs> um, but uh, there are also other cases like phishing or um, uh, uh, scams where people's uh, login details are stolen uh, for a marked plaza, which is like our Craigslist, uh, the, where you can pla place adverts if you want to sell your crap, right? And um, uh, this is used uh, a lot to uh, defraud people of their money by uh, putting stuff on there and then not sending it. And of course, your account gets blocked if you do this. But if you uh, hack accounts, then you can and always have fresh accounts with good ratings uh, where you can keep on uh, defrauding people from their money. So this is also a pretty important part of, uh, of, our, of our work, um, preventing these kind of stuff. Um, and just a really quick shout out to the book you see in the right bottom of your screen or on the right, the book that Gunther uh, so, uh, so nicely curated. Uh, there's also a feature of a story. If you want to dive a bit deeper, I uh, describe a bit more about what the increment is in police work. So not just from the definition of Scrum, really dive into the increment. And he uh, uh, published this in the book. And you can also find this online if you uh, uh, look at my LinkedIn profile. There's also an extensive article on that if you want to know more. So um, I just want to uh, move on to the uh, next topic. But again, please, if you have any questions or uh, anything you want to know, raise your hand or put it in the chat um, because uh, that helps me deliver more value to you. So this is what we dive into for the next few minutes. And um, this is uh, quite uh, interesting. I was very uh, happy that this uh, landed in my lap, so to speak, because um, in the wider organization, there, was, um, uh, 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 there are a lot of experiments being done, uh, they call it, uh, with Scrum. And um, in the police organization, in the, uh, the, the, the um, investigative part of the organization, there are uh, teams that are called Q teams. Um, and there are, the name is a bit inspired on uh, Q in James Bond, you know, the, the, the innovator huh? creating these gadgets that James Bond can use. And the Q teams are also about innovation. And as such, uh, working in an agile and scrum way in, the, in investigative work, in the daily police work, is also considered innovative at this point. Although we might see that uh, that's a bit of a stretch by now, but um, we'll get to that. And there was a recent um, experiment done and uh, very well documented. So I'm very glad that I 
that with you about um, what they uh, reached with this experiment and uh, uh, why they think that it was successful. So I hope you can, uh, can put that to your own advantage, right? And this is uh, uh, connects back to the learning point that um, if you want Scrum to work, especially in very traditional organizations, focus on the true pains of the people involved. And this does not just mean the police officers on the street. This also means their team leaders, their management, the, um, uh, uh, the, the people higher up in the chain, right? They also have pains. And um, uh, one of these pains is very prominent and that is that it, almost everywhere there's more work, there's more people reporting crime than we can solve, right? Um, it's always a, a, a struggle to, uh, to, to keep up with the workload. Oh, sorry, can I interrupt for a quick question? The yes. Hang here mean the, the pain of more working people, right? Yes. Is, is that uh, possible to link back to what if the management don't care? Is that possible to get their kind of attention or make it make Scrum work that way then? Yeah, also, but it's uh, also about the pains that the management feels. Okay. Uh, if the management doesn't seem to care, they uh, they always care about something. You just have to know what, right? And uh, then um, bring all those pains to the table and you can discuss how that can help. Okay, thank you. That's yeah. So um, this is the front page of the report that uh, I will be talking about. I will not use the entire report, obviously, but just so uh, you see how nicely they have designed it much more nicely than I can design my mural. Um, uh, and in the bottom, you see their biggest win. And that is that they went uh, within three months for this team from uh, 180 uh, uh, stale cases, cases that were not being worked on yet, but they had the information that uh, the crime was reported uh, to zero. So um, after three months already in a six month period that this experiment ran, um, they were working on live reports. So you, crime gets reported, they pick it up, they inv investigate it, discuss it, and see what they can do about it, right? So this is very, very important because in the Netherlands, the main view of the police, I asked you about how police is viewed in your uh, area, is mostly slow, unresponsive, focusing on not the important things, like writing speeding tickets or... Uh, uh, giving you a fine when you uh, uh, go through the red light uh, on the crosswalk, right? So um, it's really important that um, we um, work on things that are relevant for people. And it's really important that when someone gives you information about something impactful that happened to them, that you um, give them quick feedback about what is happening and not like uh, after three months when, um, uh, for instance, your laptop has been stolen out of your... Uh, your apartment uh, with a lot of uh, uh, damage to your door and also emotional damage because someone was in your apartment uninvited uh, that you have to wait three months and then hear, oh yeah, we're now looking into it and we're missing some information. Can you please tell us some more, right? That doesn't work. Or even worse, after three months here, well, there's not enough clues so we cannot investigate this any further. If that is the case and that happens, then you want to hear it soon, right? So you can move on with your life. Um, not to mention more impactful crimes. Um, so this is important. Um, so what they actually uh, look, uh, looked at uh, to focus on as results are three important things. This is the, um, the, the backlog of cases, yeah, the stale cases. Um, but it's also um, wasteful work by the police officers themselves, which is, of course, uh, very, uh, very bad for your motivation. And that also ties into the third one, have more uh, enjoyable work experience and more engagement in your work. And this is not just because you work on more important stuff, but also the way you work on it, the way you share the workload, etc. So how did they do this? Um, well, I have a few images to uh, illustrate that. And let's first look at the, um, the left column. And the left column was about um, mainly working on uh, reducing cases, right? The uh, most important step they took, and this is really, really something important for Scrum and Agile too, is working uh, as an entire team to deliver value because the police doesn't deliver value on its own. 
a bit by preventing stuff as, 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 as such, but really to bring criminals to trial, you also need the prosecutor. Yeah, you need the entire justice system in the Netherlands. We have uh, uh, this separated. So um, the separation, of course, is good for uh, 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 for certain reasons, for transparency uh, and, and checks and balances, but it's not good for uh, reaching shared goals. So the um, most important thing they did was bring in the prosecutor as a product owner and closely collaborate throughout the work. So uh, this means they uh, could select earlier which cases uh, would be likely to reach trial from the prosecutor standpoint, and also um, uh, um, prioritize better. So the second image that you see here, that's the value effort chart. They could uh, better uh, prioritize um, cases that had a good chance of delivering value with the effort they spent, right? And uh, the last one that they uh, implemented to do this is uh, put a target on the, the average time a case could take. They didn't have that, so the case could take forever. And for this, um, this team, which was a, a, a common crime team, uh, which is often simple cases, right? Uh, where the work time of a case is uh, from one day to uh, a few weeks, mostly. They put the, the cap on um, uh, uh, two sprints of four weeks. So eight weeks, every, every case should be closed uh, unless there was a really good reason that it couldn't happen. But this was a target, right? And uh, this helped them focus and uh, really clear out uh, the backlog of cases. Now for the second uh, part, um, and this is the um, uh, less waste of our uh, of um, uh, our spend. It really helped to make the work visible, so people could see and discuss what they were working on, and also discuss about what was valuable and what not. So they used, um, and this is an actual uh, picture of a Dutch police officer. You can see the gun in the bottom here on his hip, and he's moving tasks on the board, right? And they use magnets here, but we also use uh, stickies on brown papers or digital boards by now. Uh, now that we're in lockdown, right? Uh, so this was a really important thing. Make things visual so you can discuss them and see where the uh, valuable work is and where the waste is so you can do something about it. Um, this means you can uh, stop doing work that won't get to court. So you don't use a lot of taxpayers' money and your own effort on things that in the end don't really deliver value, right? And then the last uh, thing for this uh, topic is to um, really uh, keep a, a clear mind, uh, be calm and think about what is really the right thing to do. Uh, in the first part, I talked about uh, like uh, getting people on the right path again, if they're like the first offenders or uh, youth crimes, uh, this can really be a good, uh, good way to solve some stuff. And in some cases in the um, in these smaller departments and that do the, the, the small crimes, um, it is also about uh, without court, bringing the suspect and the, uh, um, um, and the victim together, if they want ever forces upon a victim, uh, and to sort things out uh, by mediation or something like that outside of court, right? So there's a lot of ways to deliver value in this process and not everything is like getting people into jail. Sometimes this even hurts more because in jail they, they get influenced by other criminals. So, um, and for the third part, the having more fun and engagement, um, this really helped to have teamwork, really uh, work as a team on cases. Before, in small crime cases, because there were small crime, right? Uh, you could solve them in a day of, up to a week. Um, uh, this was case on name. So um, one officer was handling a case and if this officer was sick or on holiday, it just stopped. And then they got back and they had to pick up the case again. Maybe stuff had changed, uh, new information had come in there to really restart again. Um, making it into teamwork not only made the case work faster, more robust, but also uh, uh, made the, 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 the feeling better about it. Um, this also meant, uh, uh, in connection to also making the work transparent and selecting better, that they could really do a sustainable pace. If you have like a caseload of 180 cases and you're really motivated to do a positive impact on society because you think you're helping people in your work, then it's really uh, uh, can be a heavy load on your shoulders if you have like all these people that you still have to help and cannot help yet. 
So by selecting better, they could uh, afford a sustainable pace and really have enough energy to do the cases that they do properly and, um, and uh, have energy in their work and fun in their work and also work-life balance. Uh, because they didn't have the case on name, they also didn't take home the cases anymore, like in their mind. So this also had a really positive impact on the personal um, uh, space. Oh, I see I, I'm talking all, uh, so, so much too long about the first two topics, but I hope it is helpful. I will uh, round it off, uh, Kian, thank you for reminding me. Um, and also a very important thing for Scrum to round this part off is working your strength. We have all these kind of specialists in our Scrum teams that help to deliver value. Um, and by working as a team, we also can enable people to uh, add value where they, uh, where they are uh, strong, right? Uh, if you have a case on name and it's just not in your strength, um, your personal responsibility, you still have to fix it, uh, but you may struggle a lot. And uh, now you can easily help uh, others or ask for help. And it also helps people grow and develop. So um, this result comes from four teams. And this is, uh, this is in this year. This recently uh, experiment uh, successfully uh, succeeded. Uh, but the first team already started in 2017 in the investigation. So it's not new but it's still spreading and we're still seeing a challenge, especially in helping people uh, learn about Scrum and getting uh, the proper um, uh, coaching and doing Scrum. But it's, uh, and I don't have exact numbers about how many teams now are doing Scrum in the police operation, uh, in the investigation, but a good indicator is uh, when the lockdown came, we had to all resort to digital tools and uh, there was an, a digital tool introduced. It's a Trello clone called uh, WeCan. Uh, came on board and um, uh, within a week we had 127 teams there and surely those are not all investigative teams because it was open to the entire organization also like the uh, HR office and stuff like that but it uh, says a lot that there's a lot of interest to visualizing and sharing what you're working on um, and I think it's a good measure for the agile spread in the Dutch police operation. Well, I learned a lot, <laughs> especially that the, I have a lot more to talk about than it fits in this session. Um, I'm also a, a bit sorry that we don't have time for questions. Um, but uh, Lawrence, if you want to know more, you've been the most uh, responsive one. Uh, please uh, feel free to also uh, uh, chat later or uh, whatever. We will find each other. Um, and I thank you all for listening and I hope it was valuable. I will share a PDF of the board so you can browse and look at it yourself. Although there's a lot of images and not a lot of text because I tried to make it <laughs> interesting as a backdrop. So uh, I hope it's uh, worked well, but feel free to drop me a message on LinkedIn or whatever, find me if you want to know more. And maybe we can host a meetup uh, later uh, with the other topics. I don't know. <laughs>